I'm Brad Dagan, and with me today is Ed Miller. I'm an attorney with the firm of Rose and DeYoung. I've been practicing law for 29 years, uh, extensive experience with construction, real estate, and business areas of law. Um, together with your first speaker, uh, Kim Hurtado, I was on a committee where we revised some of the MBA documents, and particularly the contract forms, and that's essentially why we're here today, is to kind of make a presentation to update you on some of the changes that have been made to the uh, remodeling contract forms. And uh, I think based upon our experience and the solid input from our committee, we've come up with some excellent revisions to the remodeling contract document. Um, and as I mentioned, Ed Miller is here today. He's here, uh, he's a remodeling contractor, and I am asked him to provide some practical advice, and I'll let Ed introduce himself. Brad and I have worked together on, on uh, many occasions through the Construction Arbitration Board at the Metropolitan Builders Association for a number of years, and I was chair of the Construction Arbitration Board uh, for what seemed like a number of years, but in fact probably was two. Um, and uh, we've worked uh, over the years developing contracts together and kind of bouncing ideas off of each other. And Brad is a guy who knows the letter of the law and knows, you know, where that's going to take it. I'm, I'm kind of here to help out in terms of practical application. How do you deal with this as a remodeling contractor? Because I've been a remodeling contractor since 1984, and I've always been very involved in, in writing contracts and being a part of any contract modifications wherever I've worked. And I do have my own company, E. Miller Associates. It's been around since 99. And I can't say I've never been in trouble, which is probably what got me involved in the Construction Arbitration Board. I've, I've been in some trouble, and I've been helped by uh, some of the very qualified attorneys at the Metropolitan Builders Association to get out of it. So I realize the value in all that. Um, looks like we have some, some new faces that haven't been a part of this before. Could I just kind of get a show of hands of anybody who hasn't actually been in the remodeler contract presentation before? Oh, excellent. That's great. That's fantastic. Thank you. I'll, uh, I'll let Brad start. You'll see me pop up every now and then. Brad might look back at me for something, but generally I'm just going to hide out because, again, he's the, he's the legal dog here. I'm just kind of supporting him and helping you all understand how we can make it work in our remodeling businesses. This morning we're going to go through the remodeling contract and then a little bit later uh, touch on the home improvement contract, which is a variation of the remodeling contract. But I, I don't want to just simply go through the contract document and sort of regurgitate what's in the form. Uh, the, the goal, I think, as Ed had mentioned, is to provide some in instruction and education on the forms that the MBA offers, but also to provide some practical advice. Um, one of the things I learned last week is that you should not hesitate to ask for help when you need it. Um, my example is I was working on some plumbing at a duplex I own in the basement. It's a 100-year-old duplex, and I figured I could un unclog a drain by myself and I uh, un unhooked part of the pipe, and then I was unhooking another part of the pipe, and it broke, and I popped myself right under the eye and gave myself a shiner, which would have been more impressive if we gave this talk on Thursday or Friday, because it was a beauty, but now it's kind of coming down. But my, my goal is that you people don't get the, the same kind of black eye that I got, and we have an excellent staff at the MBA who can help answer questions. And I think particularly in this day and age, I think we're seeing more sophisticated consumers who think they know it all, but unfortunately, I don't think they actually know it all. Uh, later on, they uh, sometimes hire attorneys who also think they know it all. But uh, I think the only two attorneys that know it all are probably myself and Kim Hurtado, who was your first speaker today. But the, uh, ultimately, as I mentioned, I think the goal is to provide both some practical advice and how to use the forms and then how to troubleshoot as projects evolve. And it seems like there's, there's three components of the overall remodeling process where we see issues arise. The, f the first of them is really the sale. And sometimes for bigger companies where there are salespeople involved, that is one of the most problem areas that I see in my practice is where a salesperson goes out, sells a project to a customer, um, tells the customer they can get all, all these potential items included in the contract price, but then ultimately when the contract is written up, some of those things are not actually included in the contract. And the customer says, how come I didn't get granite countertops? I only got Formica. Or how come I didn't get all these fancy windows? I got your, the basic windows. And the builder usually says, well, you got what you paid for. But then they, the people will go back and say, the salesperson told me that I could have all this or that I was going to get all this. So that's one area where, particularly in remodeling, it's very important that you have follow through from start to finish. And that's where our contract documents become quite important. And then once the contract is signed, of course, performance is also important, particularly in remodeling cases, because of the fact that 
if you don't follow various rules that the state of Wisconsin has set up as a remodeling contractor, you can have uh, significant trouble, and that trouble is in the form of ATCP 110, which we'll probably be talking about quite a bit today because that's a rule of law that's referenced on my outline on page one and throughout the outline. That's a set of rules that was adopted about 50 or 60 years ago to govern the practices of the flim-flam men or the, the siding and aluminum siding salespeople and also roofing salespeople who were unscrupulous. They essentially would take deposits and move on to the next town. So the rule itself had a, a solid and legitimate basis, but unfortunately it evolved over time to become a little bit overbroad and even our friends in Madison admit that the, the rules are overbroad and even apply to the honest practices and there's no exceptions. Uh, if you make a mistake under ATCP 110, um, you can be nailed for what amounts to double damages and attorney fees and there's certain rules of law that kick into play and it's strictly for remodeling contracting. It does not apply to new home construction. There must have been a good lobby that had a little one-line sentence that says these rules do not apply to new home construction right in the, right in the code. Uh, the code is part of the Wisconsin Administrative Code, which um, as many of you probably know is part of Wisconsin law, just like the Uniform Dwelling Code is. It's just a different part of the code that specifically talks about remodeling. As you can see from the outline, I, it covers a couple different things. One, it governs contract practices and what needs to be in your contracts. And the second part of it is, is it governs performance of those contracts. Um, I, th I think if we take a look at, you know, some of the, I think we even included a copy of the code, which as you can see is, is difficult and reading and it's only a few pages long, but the ATCP 110 statute should be at the back of the outline. But ultimately there's three different things that I think you should remember. It actually governs some of your practices before you sign a contract. It certainly governs what needs to be in a contract, and it also clearly governs your performance under the contract. In the outline before the contract is signed, there's a few things that it requires. One, you're supposed to identify your building permits. Two, you're supposed to identify to the owner that they are entitled to lien waivers on a proportional basis based upon the amount of work completed on a project. This is even before you sign the contract. Um, there's a list of things on page one and page two uh, that kind of govern the before the remodeling contract is signed piece. One of the things we've seen is that's difficult to comply with. I think it's tough ahead of time to know what permits you may need, especially for a bigger project. So it's almost uh, a contradiction to say I have to disclose my, the permits I need before I even know what the scope of the work will be. Um, the, the second thing is it may seem axiomatic, um, especially for lawyers, that you have to exchange lien waivers for partial payments, but a, a lot of our clients sometimes hold the lien waivers till the end of the job, which is even though they're paying the subs as they go, technically that's a violation of these rules. Um, and I think um, there are plenty of attorneys, or what I call plaintiff's attorneys, who will sue builders for violations of the administrative code even though there's no real harm or damage to their client, they see it as a potential payday because there's a, a corresponding provision under Wisconsin law that any violation of the administrative code entitles the homeowner to double damages and attorney fees. And so that's an area that we really try to be careful about. And I think that's why we have continued to evolve the remodeling construction contract. Um, there's a copy of that in your pack <coughs> and I'm, Feel free to interrupt. Yeah, yeah, I'd like to interject a little <laughs> yeah. bit. The remodeling construction contract uh, covers all of the things that Brad has talked about, but what it doesn't cover is what you do before you sign that contract with a customer. How does a customer know what that contract looks like? And I think it's really imperative for all of us to understand that these contracts are not secret. You want to get them to your customer before the day you're putting it in front of them and making them sign it. You want their input on it. And even if they make the slightest change, you know, put a revision date on it. If it's agreeable, run it by your attorney. If it's an agreeable change, and put a revision date on it, that essentially acknowledges that the customer has received the contract and fully understands and or has negotiated maybe a particular term of the contract. It's a nice way to cross the T, dot the I, and make sure you're 
you're, you're covered. You know, if, if somebody comes to you, you know, six months later and says, I never saw the contract, I didn't understand the contract, you put it in front of me the day you were going to start, I felt pressured to sign the contract. That's kind of a, a practical thing for me. I get it out about a week ahead of time. I welcome any comments or any changes via email or any written correspondence from that customer that, that they may want to make or, or talk to me about with regards to the contract. Well, that, that leads to the other point is that you as a remodeling contractor are obligated to make sure that the customer understands what is in the contract. And uh, frankly, it's a long document. The current version of it is 19 pages. Um, you know, if not even more than five or six years ago, it was six pages long. But what we've seen in the course of litigation and experience, uh, myself and other uh, attorneys at the MBA, have, and, and with input from Ed and other uh, builders have evolved this document to try to cover some of those contingencies and problems we see to help our membership in the MBA avoid the pitfalls of having to hire an attorney unless it's to sign the contract. You don't want to have to hire an attorney if there's a claim that you breached your contract. Um, ultimately, that responsibility to read the contract and make sure the customer understands it um, is something that I think Ed has come up with a good solution is to provide the customer with a copy of the contract ahead of time and actually have them either even initial it at that time or at least acknowledge that they've read it and understand it. Uh, one of the things we've also put into the document itself is that there is an identification um, or a paragraph in here that lien waivers have to be given based upon the proportional payment that is made for the work done. Um, I had a question a little bit earlier about whether or not you can take profit before the end of the job. I think you can take profit before the end of the job, but I think it has to match the percentage of the work that is done. So say, for example, you get through you know, demolition and maybe some rough framing. At that point, you're probably entitled to some of your profit and your overhead, but it should really try to match up or be a percentage that's equal to the amount of the work that's done to date. Uh, I think the biggest area where I see complaints from the consumer side is where you'll get a down payment, which I think is critical, especially in remodeling, and some people will take a lot of their profit right out of the down payment or take some of their profit up front or not be able to account for that down payment, where I think, and Ed, I'll ask you to chime in on this, but a lot of times, uh, the way I see it, is that our clients are getting a big down payment so they can buy some materials for the project or get people working on it, or maybe get a survey done and get some other work done so that they don't have the cash outlay and so that they're not becoming the finance agent for the project. I mean, do you see any down payments in your practice or what is well, your experience? Well, I mean, being design build and generally we focus on, on larger scale projects, we, we typically do get down payments. And I think the problem is DATCAP really doesn't allow for you to accept that down payment without some kind of work. I mean, the payment is made in exchange for work that's been performed. So, I mean, being design build and a little bit more maybe heavily architecturally oriented, we, we charge, you know, I give a lien waiver for the down payment for architectural services and or administrative services to date, and it could include surveying and some other things like that. I mean, at least it's a, it's a start. It's, it's a way to justify the down payment and to say that you've had some outlay or some expenditure as of that point. Whether it's dollar for dollar equal, I can't say for sure. But it's certainly worth the effort, I think, on, in any case, to, to make that attempt to give that lien waiver uh, for the down, down payment. Um, one other thing that I, I don't think made it into this version of the contract, and I will uh, sometimes put that in contracts for my clients, is actually have a, a list of the permits that they anticipate that are needed for the job. So I think it's a good idea because even if you don't identify the building permits before the contract is signed, if it's in the contract, I think a judge or an arbitrator will be hard pressed to find you at fault if you have not um, clearly identified the building permits before the contract was signed, so long as they're actually in the document. So like in Ed's example where he passes out the contract ahead of time, if you identify the building permits in the contract document and if you identify that the customer is entitled to lien waivers for partial payments, which is the other big thing that I referenced in pre-construction contract uh, requirements of ATCP 110, I, I think you'll be covered because it's in the, in the document and I, I have not had any problems uh, with building permits for those contracts where they've actually been identified in the document itself. 
Uh, one cautionary note too before I forget is uh, most of my clients modify the MBA forms. Um, the, the, the sample we handed out today has got the MBA logo on it and the MBA copyright notice at the bottom of the document. If you use this form and you edit it at all or modify it, you can do an, an addendum to the form, but if you change this form or put it on your word processing like most of my clients do, um, you, you have to take the logo off. You could say that this form is based upon the MBA contract or you could identify all over the place that you're an MBA member, which I think is a good selling point, but it's important to not represent that an edited version of this is the, is the MBA contract because I have seen that come up in a number of cases where some of my opposing attorneys say, well, you represented that this is the MBA form. They looked at the contract online. You snuck in some provisions in here, um, and therefore, you know, that's misrepresentation. So that's just a cautionary note. So if for those of you who edit the MBA forms, make sure you take the logo off or otherwise um, identify that this is based upon the MBA contract but does not exactly match the MBA form. Um, Ed, you don't use the MBA form precisely, do you? No, I don't, and, and my contracts have evolved over a number of years, but, but I think the one thing that's important to understand is when you use the MBA form, you know, you have a set of builders and attorneys and associate members who have helped put this together. It's a form, and it's, it's a, a legal form that, that the association will, will, in general, stand behind. I mean, if there's a challenge, for example, to the arbitration clause or arbitration or mediation in general, I have witnessed, you know, three times in six years where the MBA has gone to bat to, to protect that right uh, for our builders to arbitrate and mediate. So it's important to use the form and really try not to deviate from the form. And again, if you do, the name's got to come off. I, I oftentimes tell my customers that the form is loosely based on the Metropolitan Builders Association form and some things that I've learned over the years you know, through my experience. I don't have the MBA logo on it. It doesn't say I'm a member on the, the contract. It, it just basically is my company contract. Okay. Uh, going on with the uh, no that you're talking about for permits, now is that going to change this, um, where it would be, where you'd have to take the MBA logo on? No, you could do an addendum. The question was whether, if you identify the permits in an addendum, whether you could have to take the MBA logo off. I think if you do an addendum to the contract identifying the per, uh, permits, no, you don't have to, because that would just be seen as a, a supplement to the existing document. It's once you change the verbiage of the MBA form, that's where it becomes critical to let the customer know. Or, or, or not, let the, not represent that it's the standard form, because that, that has been an issue. And so that's a good idea. I mean, that's one way to use the MBA document and do an addendum and just basically include things that may not be in the standard form or your own particular custom practices. There's a section also that, I'm sorry, that also has special conditions, Lance, where you could put the permits. You could put them in special conditions at the end of, of sure. the contract, as long as they're listed in the contract somewhere. There are any number of special conditions you could put in that section. Just on, the, on that addendum and uh, permits, could you list every possible permit and say these are the possible permits, or do you, does it have to be job specific? Well, we certainly as an attorney, we'd prefer to be job specific because if you just make a blanket listing of all possible permits, um, while that might be technical compliance, that might be also seen as, you know, an improper representation of what was actually needed for that job. But I, th I think later on, the question becomes, what do you do when the customer says, you know what, I know I need those permits, but don't pull them. I did this. Um, I didn't pull a permit for a remodeling job I did because I didn't want the assessor coming through and increasing the, the, the tax assessment for my house. And I see, I get that question a lot. Um, you know, what, what do you do if the customer says, hey, I, I know we're supposed to have permits and you identified them, but I don't want to pull the permits because I don't want the building inspectors or the assessors to come through. So what do you do then? Well, either you don't take the job because it's a dangerous thing because uh, you can still get in trouble even if you don't pull the permits uh, from the local building inspectors or our friends in Madison through the state of Wisconsin. But ultimately, if you continue on with a job like that, you would really need a significantly well-drafted disclaimer signed by the customer that they were aware that they should pull permits for this project and they accept all the responsibility for not pulling the permits. Um, <coughs> I don't recommend that, but yes, you in the back, sir. Is there a reason that there isn't 
more language or a specific language regarding permits within this contract? Um, I think that's something we could still do because it's not online, and then I think we should maybe take that up because it's, I do it as a matter of course in the documents I put together um, just because I think it's an extra cover your rear end sort of thing that just in case we don't do a letter ahead of time to the customer identifying the permits, at least it's in the contract document, and then they can't come back later on and say, ha-ha, I have one more technical violation of the administrative code. So I think we should look at that. That's a good idea. If you do do that, Brad, I would highly suggest that somehow, some way, you also add in language regarding architectural control committees, mm -hmm. um, because those will last with some of these newer subdivisions. If a subdivision was started in 2000, and now that you're remodeling a home in 2015, that architectural control committee still has rights. Sure. So. Yeah, there's, there's other clauses in the contract that govern that, but that would not be a bad idea to say the ACC approval is needed and put that right up front so that we know that somebody is going to be responsible for that. Did you have a... Yeah, I would just say, if you listed all the potential permits that they may uh, occur mm -hmm. in this project, that would be good because, for instance, in window replacements, mm -hmm. you never know until you talk to the building inspector whether he's going to require you to take out a permit or not because he wants to know what's really going on. Are you changing the header on it or something? Mm -hmm. So sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. So if you listed that ahead of time in the contract, it's a non-issue. They've been informed that they might be required. Yeah, one of the things where I have a concern on that is where I think that's a good point, but my concern is if the permit might be something uh, where a significant extra charge is involved, I would really like to see either a change order or some written exchange um, where you explain to your customer, you know what, not only did the building inspector require us to pull a permit, but we found asbestos or something. So then you might incur additional costs. Another one might be impact fees too. If you don't disclose that and you just say impact fee in the contract, then you come back later and say, well, it's in my contract. You've got to pay $4,000 for impact fees. A customer or more likely their attorney will say, well, you never disclosed the 4000 bucks." So although those are usually things you would probably know ahead of time, but some of our clients aren't as sophisticated as the people in this room. So you never know. Somebody might miss that. And usually the biggest stumbling block I see is when big dollars are involved, uh, whether it's through a permit or a change order or some component of the job that results in a significant extra cost. So th the more you put in writing, the better. So I th think that's a good idea, but again, if it's going to involve big dollars, then I think you need to disclose that either in the document or one of the ways that I know Ed does it is he uses emails a lot. And I, I, I'll let him talk about that in a second, but you had a question? Yeah, you know, I was always brought up that, you know, proper documentation avoids cost of litigation. Mm -hmm. And a lot of contracts that I've seen over the years, you know, versus permits, if it's something specific that has to do with, you know, asbestos or something like that, I'd list a specific permit that's required. But a lot of times it have blankets, you know, statement con statements in the beginning of your contract saying you're going to get all local and, and state regulated uh, permits required to do the job. Is that a blanket statement still covered or do you have to itemize each? I think that that's too broad from the vantage point of the administrative code in my... Yeah, right. Okay. The downside to that is if you were to make that blanket statement then if a permit came up that you weren't aware of and I've worked in you know many different municipalities up and down the North Shore and including the West Side Brookfield Elm Grove you know, every, every now and then a permit will come up, you know, where up, oh, you're too close to the well, you need a special, you know, DNR permit to allow this to happen, and it's $250. Well, if you had listed that in your permits that you were covering it all, you couldn't put a change order out. I think you'd, you make your best effort to list all of the possible permits that would be required for that job, and I think that's all that could be expected of you. If any new permit came up that was required, I would suggest writing a change order, and if you anticipate that 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 permit is going to delay the construction timing or make more difficult for you the scheduling, I would include that in the change order and or a, uh, an extension of work time uh, as permitted because we also have to include the number of days it takes to finish these projects and the day that we're starting the projects. Okay. I, I think that that kind of flows into um, on page two and three of the outline. What I attempted to do there was to list the critical things that really must be in a written contract. I think those of you who may take the time to go back and read ATCP 110 will note that 
not every situation requires a written contract, but I tell my clients, you sure as hell better have a written contract because that's the best way to cover your butt. Um, while in some cases, you know, there are short or sometimes inadequate contracts, I think it's critical that all contracts are in writing, but I will also say there are exceptions to that, um, that rule in the administrative code. But I've kind of uh, approached this as if written contracts are mandatory because I think as a practical matter and common sense, uh, all of your contracts should be in writing. And then on these two pages, we've outlined some of the critical components that have to be in there. Uh, num number one, the name and address of the builder, but also the name of the salesperson or the, the main contact person who has been involved in dealing with the customer. That's right out of the administrative code. And I've seen some attorneys pick up on the fact that the salesperson was not listed in the contract form. But I think we've made a, we made a spot on page one of the remodeling contract for the contact person. We didn't specifically say that that was a salesperson. But I think under the case law and in my experience, as long as you identify a name on page one of the contract that is the go-to person for your company for this particular customer, that that would satisfy that requirement of the code. Um, the second point is the description of the work. This is where one of the biggest pitfalls I see is I have, still have clients who come in and say, we're going to build a new kitchen for you. Um, and that is just not enough in this day and age, especially with the detailed requirements of the administrative code. I think it's important to do a thorough explanation of what is involved if it's demolition, um, if you're going to be removing headers or so on, or doing any structural changes. And then once the remodeling area is gutted, then you have to list out what you're going to put back into the home. Um, the detailed specifications that I'm pretty sure Kim has gone over or will go over are a great tool for that purpose. The, the specification form that uh, we've developed is mainly for new home construction, but with just a little bit of tweaking, it can be used for remodeling. And I think the detail in that document is excellent where every, uh, it's designed for a, ho a home, but you could pull portions out of that for a specification for a kitchen remodel, for example. Um, I go so far as to suggest to my clients that they include, you know, name, brand, model number, color, as, as best as you can, while we all know that sometimes a customer hasn't made up their mind what kind of sink or what kind of faucet they want, um, then you have to document that later on. But at least put in here, you're going to, well, we're going to replace the sink or we're going to save the old sink or, you know, and that in the description of work is very important because then at the outset, the customer is as educated as you can make them as to what your plan is for the project. Um, I think that in remodeling cases, that is actually one of the biggest complaints I always see is that, well, it's, it, I didn't get what was in my contract. And if the contract is vague, the customer has some grounds to argue about it. I don't know, Ed, if yeah, you... I don't want to get off the track because <laughs> Brad and I have done you know, a paper trail uh, seminar too that we enjoy. And what I typically do at the beginning of the project or during the course of the project, because the size and the scope of my projects are a little larger, is have a general inclusions outline specification that I share with the homeowners uh, on a regular basis whenever we meet, if it takes two or three meetings. So that general outline specification pretty well defines their project as you go along. Every time that spec gets revised, it gets a revision date. Every time a drawing gets revised, it gets a revision date. I mean, that shows that the customer is engaged in the process. They're engaged in developing the specifications and everything that goes into their project. So at the end, they can't come back to you and say, oh, I didn't know I wasn't getting granite countertops, or I didn't know this, that, or the other thing. It's important, uh, you know, again, to, to cross those T's, dot those I's, make sure everything is laid out, and that everybody knows what they're buying. Yeah, and, and just as what's going to be included in the contract is it's just as important to try to educate the customer what the price will be um, and here too um, I think allowances are the biggest stumbling block that I've bumped into and we've changed the allowances provision of the contract to try to frankly it's to educate both the consumer as well as our membership on what is an allowance and how our allowance is calculated so in section 5 on page 2 of the contract we, have now, we now distinguish between site allowances and selection allowances. And as a means of trying to further educate, as I, you know, mostly the consumers, um, we try to let them know what a site allowance is, and we've uh, defined what a selection allowance is. And importantly, too, we have kept the warning in here that if they don't make selections in a timely manner, 
that could result in a delay in the project and ultimately that could be uh, result in a corresponding in increase in the price but uh, the calculation of the price in in most cases is going to be based upon the remodeling contractors best estimate of what the job is going to cost based upon their experience for similar type projects ideally in a perfect world it would be great if we could have all the selections made ahead of time and the the customer is ready to go you go out and get bids so you have fixed bids binding bids and so you can tell the customer and this is exactly your price I don't think I've ever seen that happen frankly especially in remodeling because there's too many variables that can come into play but ultimately the goal is is to get as close to that as possible so with using a detailed pricing sheet um, making sure you try to get selections in advance if that's possible sometimes it's not sometimes it is um, but the, the idea is to try to educate the customer what the price is going to be and what will cause the price to go up and what could allow the price to come down and that's the goal of the allowance section um, as well as the change order section. Ed, do you have any thoughts on yeah, allowances? Allowances are, are really an area in the construction arbitration process where we see a lot of issues, a lot of issues. And I think one thing that might actually be missing from the contract, or maybe not missing, but just, just allows you the flexibility of changing it, is how are the builder's costs calculated? Are they actual builder's costs? Are they builder's costs at builder's costs? Or are, do they include some kind of overhead or markup in them? You know, if you ever get to the point where, where you get into litigation or arbitration or mediation, somebody's going to want to see the invoices from that tile vendor just to, to justify the actual builder's cost. So I generally state, you know, um, you know, products shall be at the builder's cost plus a certain percentage. And that means wholesale. I mean, and that means if I can bring them an invoice from 21st Century Tile or whoever I'm doing business with in that job, I put it in front of them and say, this is what it is. This is my cost. Uh, it creates a level of comfort with them paying it. It works out, you know, super. If I go in and I add 5% to it and then I want 20% on top of that, or if I add 10% to it, I better have a reason and I better have some really justifiable administrative costs involved and it better be well defined. How do you get paid for your administrative costs or how does a contractor who has, uh, let's say they have some uh, carpenters on staff, how, how do you account for that? Well, I mean, DACAP requires us to, to list the labor rate for our carpenters, our plumbers, our heating contractors, anybody who's involved in the project. So there is some markup in, listed in, in those labor rates. You know, my burden has got to be in that labor rate. And then on top of that labor rate that's listed under special conditions is the markup, whatever you negotiate, 10, 15, 20, whatever, 30. Um, you know, as long as it's agreeable, you know, that's, that is marked up. I mean, that's my burden, which I can prove. I can, I can show the courts or I can show the arbitration board what my burden is for those people. I can also justify what I pay my plumber per hour, my electrician per hour, my HVAC guy, all of that stuff. Because um, that's, frankly, that's one of the things I've had uh, some difficulty with uh, clients over the years, too, is that uh, especially for people who have um, on staff or employees who will do some of the work, how do you bill for that? How do you account for that? Um, at that point, it starts to focus a little bit closer toward like a time and material component or alternatively, you would want to make a line item for your internal people uh, as part of your charges to make sure that the customer knows you're going to bill them for your time and this is how much they're going to get billed. There is an allowance schedule that is Schedule A to the contract form. It's page 17 of the document. Um, I think for a larger project, this is probably a great starting point, but it doesn't have the detail that I was talking about before. Uh, but it, what we're trying to do with this form is to get people moving in the right direction so that if you have, you know, let's say uh, light fixtures, for example, or plumbing fixtures, for example, you can set out an allowance, but I think it's important that the customer knows what they're going to be getting for that allowance. And if they want the higher end plumbing fixtures or the higher end light fixtures, they need to know that what you're including is just a base light fixture or a basic uh, faucet, for example. And then if they choose to make a different selection than what you've included in your quote, then you will need to do a change order and there will be an extra cost for that. And that, again, is one of the bigger 
problems I see in my practice is that the allowances sometimes don't realistically match the, the overall scope of the work. Like I have uh, one case where there's, uh, it's actually a pretty significant, almost a whole house remodel and the light fixture allowance was like 600 bucks. And for 600 bucks, I mean, I'm not even sure I could go to Menards and get the $15 fixtures and fill up the house for 600 bucks. So the allowances need to match the quality of the home, and that is reading between the lines. That is hard to communicate to the customer that unless you provide them with a, a basic specification that says this is what's included in my pricing calculation, and if you want this fantastic crystal chandelier, it's going to cost you an extra 4000 bucks. Um, that's that's one of the key things. Again, it's all about educating the consumer, and what of course we're trying to do is make sure that uh, everybody follows as much as possible the letter of the law, so we can comply with this ATCP 110. Um, <coughs> let's see. That's a great point. The, the point was that the plans and the specs should tie in with the contract, and that obviously I totally agree with that. Um, and you also mentioned that sometimes the specifications are right on the plan. Uh, unfortunately, I only see that in about 10% of the contracts that I've worked with, and it'd be great if, if there would be a separate uh, schedule for like light fixtures and a sec separate schedule for plumbing, but I rarely see that. But there, too, if you had just a written specification, uh, so even if it's not on the plan, if you have a separate specification kind of adopting what we talked about before, which is the MBA specification document, where you have that detailed list and that's incorporated into the contract, then the more detailed the spec is, the happier you are at the end of the day, of course, and the happier the customer will be too, is that if, if there's a detailed spec listing the Kohler faucet with the model number, then there can't be any confusion or any complaint later on. Well, sometimes there still are, even if it's black and white. But that's okay, because that keeps lawyers busy. Um. <laughs> I think the agreement for the contract is comprised of the specification, the plan, and the actual contract. Brad, is it possible to use your own specification format with the MBA contract and still retain the <laughs> MBA logo? Um, well, I, I think you're kind of... Oh, come on. You're smirking. <laughs> I, I like to catch them every now I think now. you're kind of pushing the envelope on that one. But I think if you... Use the standard MBA contract, and on the specification, if you specifically said this is not the MBA speci form specification, I think you're going to be covered because you've you've got a written disclosure, and it, it'll be hard pressed for that uh, a customer to later on say, well, I didn't know this wasn't the MBA form. You told me this was a standard form, um, and there too, I think the bigger problem is filling out the specification form rather than that. But I would say that you know especially for you where you really mess up the MBA documents. <coughs> oh, I mean, uh, <coughs> no, but for those who really modify the MBA forms, I think it's very important just to have a single sentence disclaimer just saying this is based on the MBA form or if the specification to say this is not the MBA standard form and then that should cover it because the customer, especially at the outset, is going to be more interested in what they're getting and what they're going to pay for that. So I, I think that that's fine, but I would certainly want to see that disclaimer in there so it doesn't give somebody some ammunition down the road for one of those technical violations that sometimes trap us in the construction industry. You had a question? Uh, yeah, I got a question for Ed, I guess. Uh, you know, you indicated your, your firm does larger projects. Do you, for, for uh, different allowances, do you do a submittals for them and just cover your liability that way doing a submittal? No, no. I, I think... Um, our allowances are, are pretty well covered, and as you know, the larger the project gets, the less likely it is that you're going to have that customer making all of their decisions on the front end, which is uh, very, very uh, difficult. But we do, we do write change orders to confirm what has been selected, and we do an estimated cost 
uh, or, or even a, an accurate uh, esti you know, estimate of cost in the change order and any length of time that that may add to the, the process uh, in the actual construction phase of the work. So, I, I mean, essentially a lot of similar things to the submittal, yeah. There's a couple other important points that are part of the basic document that has to be in under the administrative code that has to be in the contract, and I think we've uh, adopted those things and put them in here. The next item is the warranties and, and guarantees for products and workmanship. Um, first off, what we have are the basic warranty is a standard one-year warranty. And, and, we, and the remodeling contract has kind of a short version of a warranty. On page 10, it's paragraph 22. Essentially, what the remodeling contract does is say that the builder of the project is going to guarantee their work for one year from the date of substantial completion. Uh, substantial completion is kind of a vague term, but it basically means that whenever the customer can actually use the space that has been remodeled, um, I don't frequently in remodeling, or more often than not, I don't think we really see occupancy permits. Is that a fair statement? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Very um, seldom. So I, I think that usually it's the date of substantial completion, which uh, I always see that debated because the customer says everything has to be perfect, whereas we as in the construction industry say, no, it's not. If you can use the space and you're using your kitchen, there's a little touch-up work, you know, we're done. Uh, we'll come back and do that punch list work, but you're ready. Um, that's when our warranty begins to run, and that also ties to the final payment, too, in this particular form. I, I have a few clients who use a more elaborate warranty than the one-year warranty, and that's okay, but I think there, too, it's, you know, the first thing is to make sure it's distinguished from this is not an MBA form, Sometimes there's a disclaimer that people will put in there about concrete cracks, you know, wood shrinks, and uh, grout will crack and also shrink. Um, so, and then it talks about homeowner maintenance. So I think those are really great. Um, I know some of the people in here use those. Uh, frankly, that's probably the minority of the contractors who do a, a specialized warranty like that. But I like those. I just think for purposes of our contract, we tried to put together a basic form that tie us to the MBA construction industry quality standards. And also keep in mind, just as a little footnote, is that there are two different sets of M MBA standards. One is for remodeling, one is for new home construction, and there is a separate set for remodeling contractors that it, it, they pretty much mirror each other, but I have found a couple of differences that we will have to talk about in a separate committee and a separate uh, seminar. But ultimately, the one-year warranty ties to the MBA standards, and the nice thing about that is that if there are no MBA standards that specifically cover an item, then it will either go back to just a generally accepted practice in the industry, or it might sometimes go to a manufacturer's warranty or a manufacturer's installation recommendations. So there's always something to fall back to um, in the grand scheme of things when we're talking about the warranty. But if you do uh, offer more than the standard one-year warranty, it's important to include that in the contract right at the time the contract is signed because that's another one of those administrative code things that they want as much up front as possible. So if you do an expanded warranty, you really need to give it to them, uh, to the customer at the time the contract is signed. Uh, in, in keeping with that, although I sometimes don't think it's practical, the code says you're supposed to also give product warranties at the time the contract is signed, but that's impossible if selections haven't been made. So if they haven't selected a a specific appliance or something, or maybe they've changed their mind about the HVAC system and wanted some expanded or fancy air handling system. Um, and I did see a complaint like this recently where the customer upgraded to this really uh, elaborate air handling system because they had a workout room in the basement that had no operating windows. So they wanted an uh, air exchange system. And, um, and we couldn't give the warranty at the time the contract was signed, but we had an attorney later on say, why well, didn't you give the warranty at the time the contract was signed? So that's our fellow attorneys making more work for us, but that's okay too. I suppose that keeps beer in the refrigerator. <laughs> um, meanwhile, um, what I'm thinking is that we're pretty close to 11.30, so we'll probably, this might be a good time to take a five-minute break, and then we'll, we'll keep rambling on. And, uh, excellent questions. Those have been great. Keep those questions coming, please. 
Yes, sir. <clears throat> okay, I think we're, we're back after the short break. Um, the, ne the next important topic I think we wanted to cover was the uh, insurance coverage provisions um, of Administrative Code uh, 110. And we've changed the, we've changed the document to include um, some updated language about insurance coverage. So the, in the contract document on page four, section eight covers insurance. I think the, there's, the administrative code requires that you as remodeling contractors, uh, if you're going to provide any insurance for the project and if insurance is referenced at all in your contract, the administrative code technically requires that you provide a copy of your entire policy to the customer um, I think thus far we've kind of gotten away with providing certificates of insurance that are detailed as to the coverage and the amounts of coverage, but I think everybody should be aware that the, the strict letter of the rule requires a copy of the policy to go to the customer, which seems a little overly burdensome, um, but nonetheless, I think if you provide a copy of the certificate of insurance to your uh, customer, then that should comply with that uh, provision. Um, in Section 8 on, on page 4, the owner is also obligated to provide insurance. Uh, one change we made is we took out the reference to the builder's risk endorsement. And I think I'm going to let Ed address that a little bit. Yeah, for years we had a, a <coughs> paragraph that pertained to the homeowner obtaining additional builder's risk, risk insurance, uh, naming the, the contractor. Uh, and you know, you really what, what had happened, and I knew it from the day that we put it in there, it was very hard for the homeowners to get that occasionally you know, 10, 12 years ago, a homeowner could buy it. But what we found out through our insurance uh, uh, associate members is it's, it's really not necessary. It's really not available that way anymore. Um, and it's unlikely that anybody's going to be able to get it. And it was always a point of negotiation in the old contract. I think it's still in mine. Uh, and the customer would ask for an explanation. And, and you really, you could tell them to talk to their agent. Their agent would tell them they couldn't get it. So what you really want to make sure is, is the, the homeowner insures uh, all the materials uh, uh, that are being delivered to the site. They insure the increase in value to the work site. Um, you know, their homeowner's insurance doesn't exclude any work or loss due to or done during the course of remodeling. There are policies out there, there are homeowner's policies that specifically include, exclude work done during, you know, whether, you know, it's the cause of the work that's being done or not, any, anything being done during remodeling. That can put you in a little bit of a pickle because as we all know, you know, if you do have a catastrophe, and I, I've had maybe one in my life where a roof collapsed, uh, you call your insurance company, the homeowner calls their insurance company, we try to let them work it out while we continue a good relationship with our customers. How does insurance cover the theft of materials on one of your sites? I insure for that, so I don't, I don't. Uh, but isn't that supposed to be under the homeowner's policy? Yeah, technically if it's delivered, but you know, there's always that hazy gray area if it's not attached but delivered, whose is it? Do you uh, get a certificate of insurance from your customer? I do. I okay. Do. They get one from me. We, we exchange. All right. Get a lost payable. I, named as lost pay, yeah, yeah additional insured. Because I think the, the lost payee is, I think, what we're, going for these days or what was recommended by our insurance associates who are part of the MBA is to make sure you're named as a lost payee. So in the event of a th theft or a natural disaster, or, uh, windstorm or whatever, then you have to be notified and you're named as a lost payee so you don't have to wrestle with the customer about the funds or you know, if the, if the homeowner gets the check, sometimes that becomes kind of a tug of war over how the funds will be distributed and when they'll be paid out. So definitely go for the lost payee clause. Um, <clears throat> one additional clause that's in our contract forms is the three-day right to cancel. Um, again, there are exceptions under Wisconsin law as to when that is needed. I always recommend, and we put it into the MBA form, that you just, as a matter of course, include the three-day right to cancel. It's under a different provision of Wisconsin law, but it's kind of the cooling off period that's built into the consumer protection laws in Wisconsin. So I, I think if you have it in your contract documents, frankly, three days, there's probably still the honeymoon period so that usually we don't have to worry about a customer canceling within three days. And frankly, if they do cancel within three days, maybe that's a good thing. Um, <laughs> so ultimately that is in there, even though it doesn't have to be technically in all documents, but I think it's great to have it in there. So it's one less thing for somebody to complain about down the road. Um, <coughs> Let's see. Ed, how do you assign your subcontractors to your contractors? 
trade contract or vendor agreements. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, you have the proper insurance. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in order for them to get a check, they have to have their insurance in, and they have to have their either their taxpayer identification number or into my office. So we don't issue a check unless they have them. And a, you, you know what a chore that can be with some of these smaller subcontractors sometimes. You know, be difficult. Okay. One other topic that we we haven't hit on yet would be the time and material contracts, um, and time and material change orders. Um, those are permitted under Wisconsin law, of course, but the key is how you document the time and material charges. Um, sometimes it's difficult to provide a detailed budget as to what is going to be involved in time and material. I have had some bigger projects where they've been fairly short, but the, my clients will turn over all of the invoices and, and say, I'm going to have a 15% markup, and they'll show every single invoice for the entire job. Uh, sometimes we have jobs where only part of the project is time and material, and that's where this labor rate addendum comes into play. Um, frankly, this is important, I think, for either a change order, a whole job, or part of a job, where part of the project is time and material. It is important to identify the labor rate in writing before the work is done and make sure the customer signs off on that. So either the customer needs to sign a change order where we're going to uh, add something, uh, let's say we're going to add a skylight and that's time and material. The skylight will come in at cost plus markup, uh, but the labor is a little bit vague and if that's just carpentry, maybe that's 50 bucks an hour, but then that's where the labor rate addendum comes into play or put it right on the change order and say we're going to put in a skylight, it's uh, you know whatever the cost is going to be, we're going to give you the invoice, mark it up 15 percent, and then our labor is at 50 dollars an hour. And then that'll comply with the terms of the law where the, the administrative code requires time and material to basically inform the customer what the labor rate is going to be and what each trade will be charging. So if you have a project that's more time and labor uh, or time and material intensive, I would fill out this addendum and cover, you know, electrical, plumbing, and anything that might come up as long as you identify that at the outset, what you're going to pass through to the customer. And then it's also important to note that if you're going to mark up the labor, you have to inform the customer you're going to mark up the labor, too. Have you seen that, Ed, or in your practice, the time and material stuff? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I always, in all of my contracts, have a time and material, uh, a labor rate for all of the subs and all of the trades. I mean, whether I anticipate any time and material portion of that contract at all, there's always a time and material component that comes up somewhere in the course of a project. So I, I just don't leave it out. I think that cap only, almost requires us to have it in there regardless. And it's never been a, a point of contention with any of my customers. They seem to understand that that's the rate. And when you do your change order, you can go carpentry labor at $55 per hour or $65 per hour, whatever it is, uh, per, you know, addendum A in the contract or whatever you want to call it, you know, time and material addendum or whatever, labor addendum. Is that labor rate with overhead and profit or without? Well, I would probably, that, that technically is without. Your overhead and profit is covered in the contract in a separate line item where it says plus so many percent for overhead and profit. Uh, it's in, internal. It's kind of built into the contract. Don't leave that blank because, I mean, you know, it's a blank right now. And if you leave it blank, uh, I could tell you some less than favorable decisions have been made uh, when it's left blank. One other point I wanted to note that's kind of a change from the, the old contract document um, one thing that I think we've updated in both the new home contract and in, and in the remodeling contract pertains to lien rights. Um, I think we have the latest and greatest uh, verbiage that's required by state law on lien rights, but as an addendum to both the new home contract as well as the remodeling contract, we have a separate exhibit where the law requires that you give uh, notice to the customer, which is we built into the contract, so that's your notice to the customer. But we've also attached as a separate exhibit a lien notice that is designed to uh, make it easier for the customer to notify the lender uh, of the potential for liens. And that's one of those provisions of Wisconsin law that is required that we are supposed to give two copies of the lien notice to the customer at the time the contract is signed. So one of them we've built right into the contract, and one for ease of use, we've attached an exhibit uh, which pertains to the lien notice. So if you give it to the customer, 
you fulfilled your obligation, whether the customer gives it to their lender, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, but at least you've complied with your obligation to make sure the customer has that extra copy of the lien notice and that further enhances your right to claim a lien if, if and when you need to to protect your right to receive payment. Um, so that's just one point I wanted to bring up. Um, there are a couple more attachments in the in the handout and referenced in our contract documents. One of them is the, the new lead-based paint rules, which have been around for about a, well, almost a couple years now. And um, unfortunately, not all of my clients still uh, don't follow the lead-based paint rules or the requirements of the law, but <clears throat> we're trying to keep educating them, and that's why we do seminars like this, is to make sure people are aware of the lead-based paint rules. And in the contract on page 14, uh, the lead-based paint or materials uh, section is covered. And as part of the lead-based paint rules, you were supposed to provide the Protect Your Family from Lead in Your Home pamphlet, um, which I think we've made a copy of page one as part of the materials we passed out. That pamphlet should be provided at the time the contract is signed. And in fact, the owner acknowledges on the signature page that they have received a copy of that pamphlet. Is older than 1978, correct? That is true. Um, the rules kick in for homes that were built before 78 because after that time, uh, as you know, lead was no longer allowed to be used as a, a paint or any kind of product in a new home. Um, the other thing that our contract references is the EPA pamphlet uh, Lead Renovate Right. Now, technically, under Wisconsin law, that's not necessarily required to be given to the consumer, but I think we've included it in the contract document to make sure we fully educate the consumer under the EPA rules. <coughs> and while that's not completely a requirement under, uh, under Wisconsin law, I think the EPA is strongly urging that these pamphlets be provided, so we've included that in the contract as a handout to be given to the customer at the time the contract is signed. Um, how do you address lead in your practice? Well, first off, you might find some disagreement between those two documents in, in specific, so that could be a little bit of an issue. Uh, I, I do send those uh, pamphlets out to my customers, and they do get an acknowledgment sheet that they have to send back to me to acknowledge that they've received it, and they have to sign it and date it. Um, and, you know, we, we are certified, you know, lead safe renovators, and I, I have three people on payroll that are certified, which helps. And, you know, we abide by lead safe work practices. 100% of what we do are in homes that are built, you know, prior to 78. I mean, or at least 98% of what we do. So uh, it does add to the cost of the renovation. And we try to clear the site, you know, from any lead uh, prior to actually getting our subcontractor trades in there. So when my people do the demolition, they're the ones that are certified, we get it cleaned up, then we get our subtrades in, and hopefully they're not you know, pounding holes in walls that have lead paint on them, and they're not certified to do that and or you know, contain it or clean it up. That's our hope. Um, one thing I've noticed just in my practice in trying to learn more about uh, lead and how to, how to deal with lead is that the Wisconsin Department of Health uh, Services website has got some really good uh, material and I think it provides some strong hints on where the state inspectors are going to be looking when, they co when it comes to compliance. They have a couple pamphlets out called Look Out for Lead. One of them is aimed at renovators and remodelers and the other one is aimed at the consumer or the homeowner. So those are good things to take a look at because I think those have highlights that definitely the state inspectors will be looking for when they come out and do inspections. I haven't seen a lot of that yet because um, I think the state doesn't quite have its act together with respect to inspection and compliance, but I think they will, they're starting to ramp that up a little bit. And Ed, have you had any you inspections? Know, I, I've heard some stories, but you know, it's urban legend. You never know which ones are true or not, but, but they say they are starting to ramp up their inspections. Uh, you know, we've had some of the, the, the uh, people in charge of enforcement at the Metropolitan Builders Association say that, you know, they're really understaffed, they really can't hit everything. Uh, and probably the ones that they hit are the ones that are being, you know, turned into them. You know, maybe competitors who aren't practicing lead safe work practices are being turned in by other contractors. I don't know. You know, I don't technically keep a pretty low profile myself on all of that. Okay. Um, and I think one of the other... Um, the things that are a little bit new in the contract area is uh, the dispute resolution um, 
uh, area of the contract. In the new remodeling contract, we refer to the new uh, MBA dispute resolution service, and that was a, put into place a couple years ago now, where we have now separated out construction-related disputes versus either accounting or purely legal disputes. Um, the MBA still handles arbitration cases under the dispute resolution service umbrella, but it now refers out legal and accounting issues to an outside uh, third party as a means of trying to separate um, some of the issues involved with arbitration. Uh, but before we would get to a, a dispute resolution or the need for either mediation or, or arbitration, we, we have the Wisconsin Right to Cure Law, and that's, that's found in the contract document. There's a reference to the statute and then also as part of the materials, the uh, right to cure brochure, which is called Wisconsin's Framework for Successful Communications Between Consumers and Contractors, is a two-page um, outline that was prepared by the old uh, Department of Commerce, which is now, I think it's under the Safety and Buildings Division, Wisconsin Department of Safety and Professional Services. Um, as part of Scott Walker's reorganization of state government, he did away with the old Department of Commerce, but we still refer to the brochure as the Department of Commerce uh, Right to Cure bro brochure, which has got that long title with the Wisconsin framework. Um, that pamphlet needs to be handed out at the time the contract is signed. There are some exceptions to that which are kind of interesting. It's the, uh, the Right to Cure law is basically, I think, an excellent tool to promote communication just as it says between the builder and the homeowner um, and it's kind of an enforced mediation clause. I, I don't find that it has a lot of teeth in it and frankly one of the concerns I have are the long time periods involved in the statute because let's say a dispute arises during a project um, let's say the customer is not happy with the window placement for example and they stop work on the job and then you say well we've got the right to cure law which forces us to talk about the problem uh, so the consumer files a complaint, the builder responds, says, well, I'll go take a look at it. If you want me to move it over six inches, okay, I'll move it over six inches. What do you think about that? And the owner says, well, that's not good enough. Now I want two windows there. So if this, this could go on for a period of 60 to 90 days back and forth, um, the statutory framework is laid out and the time periods involved are laid out. And in a remodeling project in particular, I think that could be a disaster but at least it kind of forces people in the right direction of trying to talk about problems and trying to find solutions for problems that arise in the context of a construction contract. Um, again, I have clients who don't use that and they'll just pull that clause out of their contract and I tell them to take off the MBA logo. But at the same time, um, I've always been a fan of the MBA mediation service as being a more expeditious means of resolving disputes. Um, but one of the things that's important about that is mediation can be enforced pretty much at any time in the contract process or even once a project is done. And MBA mediation is great because we have a, a dedicated group of volunteers, uh, including Ed, and I know some people in the room have served as mediators. But mediation is essentially a negotiated resolution um, that's facilitated by a third party neutral person who tries to bring the people together to get over the hump and get past any personality issues and resolve a problem. Ed, what's your experience with that? Well, I mean, mediation and arbitration, uh, to a larger degree, are only as good as the parties that are willing to, to mediate, I mean, and the participation in arbitration. So, you know, you want to keep that line of communication open. The right to cure is a step in the right direction, but it really doesn't accomplish a whole lot other than making our customers aware of the fact that you have a right to resolve any issues that might come up as a builder, which I think is really pretty invaluable in most cases, rather than having a customer call somebody else in to solve the problem and then coming up with a kind of an unrealistic cost of what that is. So um, I think you always want to make sure that your customers are aware that, you know, you can mediate, you can, you can come up with a resolution that's mutually agreeable, but, you know, you have to mediate in good faith. Arbitration is a little bit different. I mean, what, what you arbitrate, I mean, that's, 
it's final, you know, but, but you also have to have that other side to that arbitration want to submit those documents and want to file the documents and want to be timely. So it can really drag things out. Both are great processes that have kind of been evolving at the MBA, and I think we're at a point now, as Brad said, with the administrative and accounting issues, we work with a third-party administrator, but in conjunction with some of our people who have a lot of experience at the MBA kind of sitting in, uh, and helping out with some advice as we go along. So we still maintain a connection to those services in all, all levels uh, at the Builders Association. And I think it's one of the reasons I joined the association, uh, you know, 10 years ago. Um, okay. And I, I think that, um, I think you'll find as you go through um, and perform your contracts, and if you have issues with the customer, I strongly urge that you always keep a mediation clause and an arbitration clause in your contracts. Uh, I have some of my clients who prefer not to go through the MBA process for whatever reason, but then for those cases, we usually draft up a clause that provides for binding arbitration, uh, some form of mediation, whether it's at the MBA or through an outside third party. But importantly, we have mediation still in our contract and arbitration still in the contract. And I think our ethics rules and bylaws of the MBA require arbitration in your contracts. It doesn't have to be through the MBA service, but frankly, it beats the heck out of going to court and litigating something for a year or two, which as, you know, the attorneys like that, but I think you as contractors don't like that. So that's why we put in the mediation and arbitration clauses. I frequently will say a retired uh, circuit court judge from either the Mo Milwaukee or Waukesha metro area, so you always end up with try to sign somebody local, um, and usually the retired judges, uh, if you can mutually agree on them, they generally do a pretty good job. Um, I know there are other clients who use the uh, AAA, American Arbitration Association, which kind of stems out of Chicago, and while that's an excellent process, I think for complex commercial arbitration matters, I think in residential construction, it can drag out and almost be as expensive and time consuming as a lawsuit. So I try to shy away from that and focus more on a retired judge or a mutually agreed upon third party to serve as the arbitrator. Um, <clears throat> so I think th there are a couple other points I wanted to hit on here. Um, one of the things that I frequently get asked about are design agreements, especially for bigger projects and remodeling and new home construction. And there too, uh, just, just like the remodeling contract itself, in remodeling, if you do a design agreement, you really have to focus on trying to comply with the requirements of the administrative code. And without getting into a 19-page contract, what I've kind of come up with and my clients have worked with um, is a, a shorter version that hits on the highlights of the contra written contract requirements that are back in the outline of sort of a start date and a completion date how much it's going to cost the customer, and if there's any other hidden contingencies such as surveys or, or even some, some demolition I've seen in some design agreements, although that rarely comes up. But nonetheless, we have to comply with some of the written requirements for a design agreement for remodeling, just as we do for the actual project itself. So if you ever do design or draw up a plan, um, while it doesn't have to f be as full-blown as the remodeling contract, I strongly urge you to include some of those things we've talked about, particularly the start and completion date, the scope of the work, you know, how many plans are they going to get for the money that they are asked to pay, how much it's going to cost, and what happens if a contingency comes up, like we say, you know what, we need a survey. Um, so those kinds of things, you know, the more we put in writing, the better. And I, I think that that's why we've provided that checklist. And so for a design agreement, just like the new home contract, those things should be complied with. Do you use design agreements, Ed? Nope. <laughs> how, do, how do you, uh, do you get paid for your time? Uh, generally, lately, no. I mean, in this competitive environment, I, I haven't been able to justify, you know, getting a reasonable amount of money to, to pay for our time involved in speculating on a project. And I hate to say that because, uh, I've always been a proponent for many, many years of absolutely getting paid for anything that you do. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I have used design agreements in the past, and I do have them. I, I, we addressed this issue with DATCAP in Madison several years ago, and, of course, Brad and I were, were there. And, and one of my 
greatest concerns was how do we exclude the design agreement from you know being governed by DATCAP because I think it's impossible to know for example when you're doing an exploration on a design how much this is going to cost I mean it, you know you might have a rough idea but you know how could they hold you to it and you know the sense that I got from uh, from the people at DATCAP was well it's really not a part of it but they wouldn't put that in writing and they wouldn't make that change so I think they would use it against you if they they had to in any particular situation and we're still currently at the state level working with uh, DATCAP and the rules trying to get some things uh, modified to be more workable I mean it's it's not that we're trying to to make it in the favor of the builder we're just trying to make it tenable we can actually deal with it we can actually comply with it and I think that some of the biggest issues with that cap is you you can't comply with everything well yeah that was it was very educational I think to try to talk with the, the our friends in Madison about ATCP 110 I think we pointed out at least six contradictions in the rules they acknowledged that the contradictions were there, seemed a little bit eager to help make those changes, but then at the end of the day they said, well, we think that's more of a legislative matter and you'll have to address that through a different committee and run that through the state legislature. So it's, it, and that's, I think that's an ongoing process. So this ATCP 110 is certainly in its present form going to be around for a while, and I know there's a continuing effort to change those rules and make them a little bit more logical uh, more practical and frankly more realistic in, in many aspects but I don't think we're going to see a total abrogation of that of course because it's 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 really there for consumer protection and certainly to repeal it would not be likely but maybe to modify it and make it more workable hopefully is a practical reality but that remains to be seen uh, all after experiencing that whole process and trying to lobby for a change in the rules it made me want to become a state legislator or an administrative person because it seems like they can have all these meetings and not really do anything, and that was rather appealing to me. Didn't uh, I have a severe bodily reaction after that meeting with Dan Cap oh, and Madison? That's back. right. Yeah. <laughs> On the way back, yeah. yeah Ed, I won't uh, go into detail. <laughs> yeah. But needless to say, the administration of Madison did something to me. Yeah. But the, it's um, certainly something to be reckoned with, and I think the the outline hits on the highlights of the rules. Um, one other topic I wanted to cover was the Home Improvement Agreement, which is uh, somewhere in your pack. It's a, a scaled back version of the remodeling contract, and it really was designed at the request of some of our uh, more focused um, remodeling members, say uh, window installers who just did window installation. They asked for a shorter version of the contract that might be more workable for like the single line type uh, effort. So this one is called the MBA Home Improvement Agreement. Um, as you can see, it's, it's two pages long, but it does carry uh, several pages of standard terms and conditions attached to it. Um, and then even as part of that, we have a labor rate addendum too, which I think is particularly important for the single line contractors. Um, I distinctly recall one of the window suppliers asking for the, this type of a form. And essentially this form is focused enough but still complies with the, the ATCP 110 rules and I think it's easier to comply for the single line contractors rather than when you're doing multiple aspects of a project. Um, but in this particular case this document will comply with the major written contract requirements that are set forth in, in my outline which are really adopted out of the ATCP 110 rules. But again, even for the, the window people or the garage or garage door people, um, this is the type of form that is important to use um, just because again it, it will put you in technical compliance with ATCP 110 and if you do anything outside of any of these documents, I think it's critical to document everything in writing and, and use change orders or other forms of communication to really verify any changes that you make to either the scope of work or the pricing that's involved. Um, one thing we didn't hit on either was the notice of delay and there's a form for that that we've developed. Uh, one thing that I would recommend is that the notice of delay form seems a little ominous by itself. So what I've developed for a few of my clients is um, just a letter that adopts all of the things in the notice of delay, but it's a real flowerly, nicely worded letter, and then it, it does inform them of the delay, what's going on, what happened, there's a delay in either, let's say, a supplier, uh, or maybe there's a change in a contract. 
where somebody ordered different cabinets, and if it's custom cabinets, that's going to add 30 days to the completion date, for example. Those things need to be documented in writing. Now, I know Ed has told me that he uses emails to document some of well, those things. I think everybody has their own way of, of documenting a notice of delay, and I'm sure some are more uh, admissible, enforceable, whatever you want to call it, than others. But typically, I, I include it in my change order because it's only obvious if the customer is making a decision in a way of a change in a material or product or specification that it may impact the timeline for the, the project. And I include a lot of the, the important uh, parts of that, obviously, the number of days extended, you know, are they working days, are they calendar days, um, the changes, you know, the cause for the extension or the delay. Uh, and if I had a weather delay that was significant, I would I would write a special separate letter, you know, to that effect, as opposed to putting it in a change order. But for most things, uh, once those selections are firmed up, a notice of delay is uh, a part of my change order. It seems to work well so far, but uh, who knows? And we develop, developed the notice of delay form because the again the administrative code requires any delay in a project to be documented in writing, and that's essentially what this notice of delay form does. Is that it sets forth and informs the customer that there's a delay. It's going to add a certain amount of time to the project and potentially add some cost to the project. Sometimes this will stem from unforeseen conditions. Uh, sometimes it may be a selection delay uh, by the customer. And to, for that, it's sometimes hard to use a change order. But I still like the idea of maybe adopting what's in this form into a letter because I think it, it's better diplomatic relations with your customers when if they get an official form that says notice a delay across the top, psychologically I think you're going to be at an advantage by using a letter that incorporates all the same information in here. Um, but at the same time, the key thing is to inform the customer of a delay that let's say they failed to select some colors or they failed to select some plumbing fixtures and that throws everything out of sequence for your job that's going to add three weeks to the project. Technically, that, must, that notice of delay must be in writing, and if there's going to be any change in cost, that has to be in writing as well. And the customer has to agree to it in writing, but again, either a letter that's acknowledged by the customer or an email, where Ed told me, I think, one time that he's got a clever way of getting the customer to respond by, um, what, what do you do again? I didn't want to do this on tape again, because <laughs> I did it before, um, or on, on video, but... I, it's not trickery. I mean, it's just simple, straightforward communication with your homeowners. If, if there's going to be a delay or, or, or a change in cost or a, a verification of selection, I mean, you know, send them a change order uh, that confirms all of that and get them to reply to it. I mean, you know, no matter what it takes to get them to reply to it, you need some acknowledgement that they've read that change order or that, that letter or that email. You You need to know somehow that you can print something out that says, you know, Mrs. XYZ responded by saying, you know, I had to take my dog to the vet the other day and he was sick, so I'm sorry I, I couldn't get back to you sooner, but yeah, everything's fine, go ahead and do it. Well, you know, that's not a change order, but it's an email and it confirms that they were aware of the fact that it was going to increase the price, extend the length of time, and until such time that you can put it in writing in a, in a formal change order format, because you know, sometimes it's a moving target with customers and selections, uh, you've got to get something down before you commit to that financially. So that works, you know, pretty nicely for me, but it does make for quite a volume of paperwork. That, that's, I, I really like that approach. I've, I've had one client where that backfired a little bit, um, only because they didn't get everything acknowledged in writing. This was a case where there was like a master bedroom, master bathroom remodel, and the master bathroom remodel sounded pretty fantastic, but where they were putting in a two-person shower and, uh, and some really nice tile. Well, Mrs. Homeowner changed the tile order from a very nice tile to like a phenomenal artistic design art pattern, which added $20,000 to the cost. And um, my client got everything agreed to except for the cost in, that, in writing. So had he sent that email notifying them of the cost, um, they did make the selection and everything, but he didn't notify them of the cost. So we ended up negotiating and resolving that to avoid litigation or further disputes and keep the project going. My client took a hit where I didn't think it was fair that he had to because clearly this was ordered, and I think that she kind of blew the budget that had been set out with you know the husband and the wife so that they must have had a few uh, festive discussions at home about that and she may have denied that she knew that it was going to be that much more and as you know if, if you don't have it in writing and don't have it acknowledged that's where you can run into trouble um, and I, I think it's important uh, 
to include in anything you do the scope of the work and the price you're going to charge in as much detail as possible. I recently had a client who came to me about a, a, a first floor remodel for a, a guy who was pretty sophisticated, uh, pretty savvy, read all the documents, asked about the, the, um, all the details of the contract. But in this particular case, uh, he was so demanding that my client almost walked from that job and he asked me for my opinion, which is always a dangerous thing because we attorneys are not supposed to get business advice, but I usually do anyway. Um, in this particular case, um, we went through the contract and went through the selections and what the potential pitfalls were. And I just suggested to my guy that he just put a few more things in writing, make sure the allowances were clearly identified. And here was one where he enhanced his explanation of what is his base or what's standard for this type of job. And then I said, you know, after all of that, I'm still on the fence because I saw some of the blistering emails from the potential customer. But once we had all that detail down, I said, you know, that kind of tips the scales. It's a big job. Um, so he, he took the project. They finished it. They had no glitches. And now he's gotten a couple referrals off of that. But I think the key goes back to the beginning of the job, which is kind of what we've been preaching all along, is that at the outset of the job, the more detail you have in writing, the better you communicate with the client as to what the scope of work is and the price, the happier you're going to be at the end of the job or throughout the course of the job when you're trying to get paid. Um, I don't have any other comments. Ed, do you have any follow-up? No, not generally. If anybody has any questions specifically about how to utilize some of these forms. So am I hearing you correctly that if I send an email and it lists everything we're going to do and dates and costs and so forth, and if the customer responds, uh, to that email saying, yes, go ahead and do that, that's as good as a written change order? As long as it's clear that they've accepted the change in the scope of work and the price, I think that's going to be binding because that's effectively emails are being more and more recognized as legally binding writings. It's a little bit risky, but I think you're still going to be okay. Yeah, then I could send them a hard copy. Yeah, I'd back it up with a change order at yeah. some point. I wouldn't yeah. let that hang out there forever. No, but I wouldn't either, yeah. but I think that, that yeah. expedites it. Yeah, but yeah. Because, frankly, if, if, uh, if it's not binding as a contract to the letter of the law, it still will be binding from an equitable vantage point of you did the work, you expected to be paid, the customer knew what the cost would be, so it would be unfair for them to retain the benefit of that work without paying for it. So if you can show an exchange back and forth by email or fax or even a handwritten note, I think that's going to be binding just as long as it's clear that the customer agreed to that change and agreed to the price. Any other questions or thoughts? And I think we have hit our time for today. Thank you for your time. Excellent questions. I think some of those points, I'm going to go back to our committee and try to adopt them into our contract forms, which should be ready in a matter of a few weeks. Thanks again.